Good morning. The Department of Joint Warfare Studies welcomes you to today's lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Lieutenant General Alan Peck, United States Air Force, retired. Currently, General Peck is serving as the director of the Air Force Research Institute here at Maxwell Air Force Base. AFRI is charged with conducting objective research, outreach, and education to enhance the effectiveness of air power in support of national security. Focused on dissemination of professional ideas, AFRI publishes the Air and Space Power Journal, which is currently published in four languages, and the Strategic Studies Quarterly. AFRI also oversees 125 officers selected to serve as Air Force fellows at leading universities, think tanks, laboratories, major defense corporations, and in key Pentagon offices. General Peck retired from the United States Air Force in 2011 after 36 years of distinguished service. In his last active duty position, he was the commander of Air University. General Peck earned his commission upon graduation from the U.S. Air Force Academy. After completing graduate pilot training as a distinguished graduate, he went on to become an F-15 aircraft commander, instructor pilot, and standardization and evaluation flight examiner. General Peck completed two tours on the air staff at the Pentagon and a joint assignment as Chief of Current Operations at U.S. Central Command. The General commanded an Air Operations Group in Germany, an Air Expeditionary Wing in Saudi Arabia, and the Air and Space Expeditionary Force Center in Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. General Peck was a key planner for NATO's Kosovo Air Operation and served in the Vicenza Combined Air Operations Center as the Chief of Combat Plans during the subsequent campaign. He also served with the Commander of Air Force Forces at the U.S. CENTCOM Combined Air Operations Center during Operation Iraqi Freedom, Major Combat Operations. During a subsequent tour as Deputy Combined Force Air Component Commander, he oversaw planning, tasking, execution, and assessment of coalition operations for Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. The general was a command pilot with over 2,007 hours in the air-to-air -air and air-to-ground variants of the F-15, including more than 300 combat hours. On top of that, he was mentioning that I shouldn't say that he was a distinguished graduate at certain places, but honest to God, he was a distinguished graduate everywhere he went. Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks, boss. Appreciate it. Hey, gang. Hey. I think it's, uh, it's traditional for folks to say they're happy to be here because they're out of the Pentagon. For me, I'm a cheap date. I walked over. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, give a shameless plug for our literature, by the way, the uh, Strategic Studies Quarterly and Air and Space Power Journal, which are available online. But uh, I strolled over here today, and, uh, and it got me out of a staff meeting, so I am truly happy to be, be here today and talk about something that's of, of keen interest to me, and that is uh, command and control of air power. See if I can get this thing to work here. Here we go. So these are the things I was asked to talk about: some uh, CFAC and COMAF4 things, and then and future trends. And I'll leave some time at the end for some questions. Uh, Pause was kind enough to go through some of the background. I got some tactical experience and some str more strategic experience. But in the middle there is uh, some time I spent in the in Combined Air Operations Center at the operational level of war, uh, learning from some of the the masters. Uh, in, in 1998, uh, NATO had not authorized planning for the Kosovo operation, so the U.S., the United States, with a, with a couple of allies, got together on our own, essentially, and, had, and, and started the planning in 1998. And those eventually became Kano plans for what was uh, Allied force, and I was part and parcel to that effort. Had a great team there. Went down to the CAOC for the 78, 79-day uh, operation. Um, and, and involved in, as you see there, the GATT. Um, doesn't mention the master air attack planning, uh, airspace, uh, information warfare, ATO production uh, over at PSAB and then at uh, Al Udeed for a year as well. So here's some home movies. Uh, up in the upper left hand corner is uh, Mike Short. I had a chance to work with, with General Short. He was the CFAC for Allied Force. 
Um, it, we're kind of smiling in that picture, but it was shortly after uh, we, we were, every morning we'd come in and we'd have a gathering, the, eight, the C5 and the C3 would get together and talk about what happened overnight, what we're doing that day. And I'd, you know, General Short's hard to get comfortable with, um, but over, after a little while I started feeling comfortable and, and this picture was taken right after he caught me pilfering one of his bananas from his uh, little breakfast tray. And uh, he went apoplectic on, on that and said, Beck, what are you doing? <laughs> Later on, we took a picture. But I actually mentioned to him, I said, hey, I'm going to go over to ACSC. And, uh, and they give me an hour to tell them everything I know about command and control of air. And he said, hey, that's great, Peck. What are you going to do the other 55 minutes? Uh, yeah. Uh, here we are in the, in the lower right, it's Dutch Holland, Randy Gelwicks, General Short, and myself. This is uh, in June of 1999 after Milosevic had given up. And, um, and so we were having a little piece of cake and a beer in the courtyard. And, and not long after this picture was taken, General Short gets a call. Um, and one of the guys came running out and says, General Clark's on the phone. General Clark's on the phone. So General Short goes back in, and, and it's Wesley Clark on the phone. I'm figuring he's going in to say, hey, congratulations, you know, great job. Instead, he yells at General Short and says, uh, Mike, they're telling us that you only killed 10 tanks in the whole air operation. What's up with that? And, and so Short says, well, I guess it was enough. Well, that was the wrong answer, and as many of you know, <laughs> That started the, the Air Force on a whole uh, uh, episode of, of trying to find uh, technologies that would discover tanks under trees and, and all kinds of other things. Could, we can get into more detail on some of that. But in the end, it achieved the, uh, the desired effect. Um, and, uh, but the fact is that you know, with the, uh, the MUP and the VJ, who were the, the folks who were harassing the coast of our Albanians, um, their primary goal was to hide and survive, and you can do that without ground forces in there to help root them out, without folks on the ground to give the intel. It was a pretty tough, tough task to, uh, to actually go out and attrit the, uh, the forces that were doing the evil. General Buchanan, I had a chance to work for him, General North. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between being a CFAC and being a COMAF-4, but it sort of sums up here. Here's the CFAC job. I'm giving tours of the... Uh, of the KOC at Al Yadid to uh, Bush 41, and then uh, inspecting logistics. <laughs> at, uh, this is Comap 4 duties, uh, the mother of all bombs. So let me talk a little bit about this. I, I, part of the desired learning objectives here were to do a, a, a quick uh, review of doctrine. So those are the documents. Here's, a, here's your pop quiz. About doctrine, service and joint doctrine is authoritative, directive, is it policy? Any guesses? D, D is probably the most common one that we find out there, is that uh, you know, whenever you're charged with an operation, the first thought is let's take a blank sheet of paper, this has never happened before, and start drawing wiring diagrams and figuring it out. In fact, doctrine captures best practices and lessons learned, but it is not directive, it's authoritative. So it's a, it's a place to start and deviate from, and that's the, the main lesson on that. Um, I was told you'd already had a plenty of doctrine, so this is your doctrine review. Any questions? Command relations? Good. We got that done. <coughs> so I realize this is going to be somewhat U.S. Central here, centric here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the relationship between a commander of Air Force forces and a Joint Force Air Component Commander. The service component, you will, from an Air Force perspective, from a service perspective, you will have a commander of Air Force forces. And this is how we will tend to organize within Air Staff. And you will have an AOC, even without, unless, even if you're not a, designated as a, a JFAC or a CFAC, you'll need an AOC to do your OPCON responsibilities and control your forces. And we typically will deploy as Air Expeditionary Wings and Groups. It is customary based on the preponderance of force and the ability to do command and control that the component that has the, those capabilities will also be the functional component and that's the in this case would be a JFAC or a CFAC and your AOC will become a joint or combined air operations center with a, a staff and then you'll have uh, allocated uh, forces take on um, and it, these are the service of the U.S. forces, but it will also include uh, forces from, from coalition members. So that's kind of the basic construct, and it, it, again, that's pretty basic. Why does all this matter? I mean, who cares? In fact, I would say the air component is probably more, 
anal, if you will, uh, about this than other services that tend to, tend to mix the two together. Um, and part of that has to do with the makeup of our, our forces, which tend to be, as opposed to in, in separate areas uh, geographically, we will mix together tankers from multiple countries, uh, fighters from multiple services in multiple countries, uh, and, and the staffs will also be mixed together. So, many of you remember the, the story of Marcus Luttrell. Um, there were four SEALs in Afghanistan who got compromised. Um, and this was not long after I'd showed up at the, at the CAOC in, uh, in 2005. And uh, a rescue force was sent in. Two CH-47s went in. One of them got shot down and had 16 on board, uh, and, and, they were, uh, and they were killed. And in the process, they were trying to find the, the, recover the four SEALs who'd been, uh, who'd been compromised and then were isolated. And in the process, we had some ISR assets overhead. One of them was a Predator. And we had video of what was going on to try to orchestrate, and it was, it was a pretty chaotic scene. Uh, so the, uh, uh, as, as sometimes happened, the weather started closing in, and the folks who own the Predator said, it is, we're going to exceed our tech order limits. We have to bring the aircraft home. And the decision was made, no, this is more important because of the, the nature of the mission. It, you've got to stay on station. Um, in, in spite of the fact that that's, it violates your service minimums. Uh, and that was the right decision. And, and in fact, the, when, at the, when it started to go home, it iced up and crashed. Uh, and that's a risk you take. The problem was that the decision was not made by somebody who had operational control. It was made by the RAF uh, Air Commodore, who was at the CAOC at the time, um, because I was on my way back in and hadn't gotten there before that decision was made. And nobody questioned whether the decision was made. It was just who had the authority to make that decision. That was the CAOC had TACON, not OPCON. And TACON doesn't give the authority to exceed the limit. So we had to develop a process. And in this case, it's a predator. And there's no funerals for predators. And that's the good part of it. But you know, if it had been an EA-6, if it had been a, 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 another aircraft, a C-130, and you did that, then it becomes more problematic because you need someone with the authority and the understanding of what you're actually doing when you're violating service, mi service, service minimums, such as altitudes, fuel requirements, uh, crew duty days, and those kind of things. So that's why it's important that you understand the distinction. So those kind of decisions are made at the, at the right level by the right folks. And, and after that, we established a process. Typically, the special operators would, would come in, and they'd need a predator to stay on station in spite of the weather. And we would assemble the right folks, including those who own the Predator, the, uh, the weather folks, the special operators, and, and the, the, op the representative of the OPCON authority, which was uh, uh, CENTAF, and would say, OK, you stay on station and, and violate. And that way, the risk is placed in the right place. So you have two staffs to help you. Kind of an eye chart, but basically shows you I mean, there's a lot of things that go on, but some of these responsibilities you know, these are administrative responsibilities, and the commander of, of Air Force Forces accomplishes those, and these are joint responsibilities, and those are the responsibilities of the, of the JFAC. And you have staffs that help you do these things, um, and typically this will be a joint and combined staff. So here are some of the challenges, and I've narrowed these down, but uh, and to me, as I would walk into any Combined Air Operations Center, whether it was Vicenza or at uh, Prince Sultan or at Al Udeed or anywhere else, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, a, a uh, the orchestration of air operations is something we take for granted. It is just, to me, still mind-boggling. Even though I understand all the details of how it works, to me, it's an amazing process and, frankly, is underappreciated. How many of you have served in a CAOC? Excellent. Well, so I'm, yeah, you, you all understand what I'm talking about, is how that all comes together and works, uh, to me, is, is, is absolutely amazing. So here are some of the, the things that I think uh, are, are important in terms of the, the key challenges. One of them, you've got to master these responsibilities. And I've got two charts here. One's the COMAF-4. These are the responsibilities of the commander of Air Force Forces, and which are typically the responsibilities of any of the service component commanders, whether it's the R4, the NAV4, the MAR4, uh, uh, would have these responsibilities. 
to include the uh, administration and discipline, force protection. I can't tell you how many times this was mixed up by the higher headquarters staff who would say, a task would come down and say, CFAC, uh, establish force protection here or send this send these munitions over here. Well, that's not a CFAC responsibility. Those, those are Commander of Air Force Forces responsibilities. These are what CFACs do. Recommend courses of action, strategy, ROE, air point apportionment. Typically, and not always, and by the way, you don't have to be establish a CFAC, but it has, again, become a fairly, uh, fairly accepted after the first Gulf War. Typically, at the beginning stages, the CFAC will be as it was in, for example, Iraqi Freedom. The air component commander will be the supported commander for counter air, for strategic attack, uh, overall air interdiction, most space control, and ISR, and will be the supporting commander for close air support, AI that's behind the FISL or within, the, within the other components, AOs, and, and maritime support and will act as airspace control authority, area air defense commander, and space coordinating authority, if designated, and then the personnel recovery and CSAR operate. So that's a lot on the plate for the, uh, for the CFAC. So then you get these big old, big old staffs to, to make this happen, doing all these things on the, on the blue side, all these things on the, on the purple side. In some cases, you know, for small operation, you could probably combine these staffs we did that, for example, when we sent humanitarian aid down to Mozambique in 1999 after a big flood. And so, you know, a, a couple of folks with a laptop, if you're doing a couple C-130s, can, can do this. In a major operation where you've got, you know, we may have, I think in, in some case, we had 300 uh, airlift sorties a day. Uh, you've got uh, maybe 1,000 a thousand sorties of kinetic sorties of air to air and air to ground and so forth. You need a, a big staff with separate responsibilities to do these things. Airspace control, air air defense, space coordinating authority, the personnel recovery business, the inner theater lift, theater electronic warfare, and the, and the joint training and doing all these things takes a staff uh, with expertise and representation, by the way, you know, people talk about, well, you know, you Air Force guys. This is not an Air Force thing, okay? Typically, the, the Air Force will supply the facility and the core, but this is a, a joint and, and combined effort. In fact, most, much of the talent that runs this thing comes from other countries. Uh, the Brits and the, and the Australians, for example, supplied uh, superb CAOC directors. Uh, other services, the Navy's uh, second fleet has expertise in AOC business, so it's, it, it, this is not just an Air Force thing. Pretty complicated stuff that you got to oversee. You got to have the right people who understand this business for the theater air control system and, and, and air ground system. I'm not going to get into this, but it gets to be very, very complex, obviously, to make all this work. And here are the products that you're going to produce or you should produce. I would tell you that, uh, you know, we've done operations strictly on PowerPoint, uh, but to do it right, this, this is what's required. Joint Air Operations Plan, an Area Air Defense Plan, Airspace Control Plan, and by the way, your air, Airspace Control Plan will then deviate every day with an Airspace Control Order as you update the, uh, the, what you're doing on airspace. An AOD, an ATO, which most people recognize what the ATO is, and then the air defense orders and, and airspace control orders. The wheel of death. Uh, this is what it's, this is the doctrinal view of how this happens. Uh, it's an orderly process. I mean, it happens pretty quickly, but it, it allows all the right inputs to be vetted. And let's face it, air power is a finite asset. And you want to make the most, not just efficient, but effective use. And so there's a process for doing that. That can be short circuited when you need to. And that's probably one of my main lessons here is, yeah, this is a complicated process, but it doesn't mean that in real time, if a high priority target pops up, you, we've got the capability to divert forces and go attack a high priority target, even though it wasn't input 72 hours uh, uh, at the start of the circuit. This is kind of how the, 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 this is how the ATO battle rhythm unfolds. And what that allows you to do is, is take your strategy, Develop the target so you make sure you got the right weapon, the right desired mean points of impact. Uh, you've done the weaponeering. 
and and uh, and now you can uh, make sure the munitions folks load the right munitions. The, uh, the the folks flying the missions have got the right briefings. You can package them together to include tankers and electronic warfare and CSAR and air-to-air -air support and everything else, and go hit the target. Again, you can do things on short notice, but it will probably be less effective and, and less efficient. Basically, you got five ATOs in process at any time. Typically, you'll have somebody. A, a, this, you know, these are vertical processes here. You've got folks that do GIPTOLs, you've got folks that do the, the, uh, the MAP or the MAOP and so forth. You also will typically designate one or two folks who carry the football for each ATO and follow it all the way through the process. But it doesn't mean it can't be short-circuited. An allied force, for example, this would be the doctrinal flow of, of, and, and some of these terms are a little bit outdated because this was back in 1998 and some things have changed, but you've got a flow for how these happen. Well, the senior leadership, General Clark or Admiral Ellis, had wanted to be updated and provide updates at times that may not have been completely convenient in terms of the doctrinal flow and would provide guidance. So you'd have VTCs in the middle of some, while you're in the middle of guidance, enforcement, targeting, you'd have a VTC or you're already developing the ATO, you'd have VTC and get some, some direction to go do something different. So, modified the, the cycle. Uh, typically, you know, you're going to modify your cycle to fit the higher headquarters as opposed to expecting the higher headquarters to adapt to, to your cycle. And I've never been part of a, an operation where something like this didn't happen, where you took the doctrinal flow and you changed it based on the situation. I'm going to talk a little about command relations here, and uh, without going into excruciating detail, but there's typically two chains. You have, at least in our doctrine, you have a service chain, which has the uh, ADCON support, and then you have the operational chain. Uh, a couple options here for CFAC. One is to essentially have a, a theater CFAC COMAF4, and then those are, if you have subordinate joint task forces, then you based on the priorities established not by this guy but by this commander here you point that fire hose in whichever direction it needs to go now i would tell you that sometimes this causes some heartburn because the jtf commanders say hey where's my kaoc where's my cfac and so there is another option and that is as opposed to supplying in this case is where you're putting a liaison if you will uh, at the jtfs here, you actually put a separate facility with a JFAC and his, and his own Air Forces. If they're geographically separated to where the two probably don't interact, that may make sense. It becomes more problematic when you could take forces that are used here and you may want to use them over here. It becomes more challenging to do that, again, if the weight of effort should be over here. But that is an option and it's included in doctrine uh, and it's really at the behest of the, com of the combatant commander. So this is another case where the JTF could have a commander of Air Force Forces and, and a JFAC subordinate. But it's never that clean. I'll just show you that the fact is that, okay, when you get it out in the real world, and again, sometimes because folks start with a clean sheet of paper or the situation dictates differently. So uh, this is JTF Haiti. You see, it's, it, I mean, it doesn't look as clean as the one, that, uh, the one that I showed you, and I can just show you some other examples. This was uh, Noble Anvil, which was Allied Force. Uh, again, an, you know, sort of a convoluted, uh, and it has to do, some of that has to do with the U.S. versus the NATO versus uh, other components in other countries, uh, and it gets very complicated. This was uh, the ISAF uh, relationships. Um, some of this is sort of touched on in a, a book by uh, Dag Henriksen that's just come out. It's available online uh, on the AFRI website, by the way. But Dag goes through uh, looking at uh, U.S. commanders and NATO commanders in uh, Afghanistan and, and, comp and compares and contrasts their reflections. But, but part of this was, uh, as you can see, becomes problematic. And, and I'll just say somewhat, I guess, off the record here, some of this had to do with the politics of concern about having too many U.S. Air Force or U.S. officers in charge of this operation. So uh, that's why some of these things uh, ended up being not doctrinally pure. Uh, 
Um, but in this case, you had the NATO chain and the U.S. chain. But, but if you think about it, the NATO mission and the Operation Enduring Freedom mission had somewhat different perspectives. Uh, the Enduring Freedom mission included a counterterrorism piece to it and was also mixed into what was going on in Iraq. And so had more of a theater perspective, whereas the NATO mission was, was fairly focused on countering the, the Taliban. So there's a lot of tensions that come out of that, and some of these are, are indicated here. You know, in the case of, uh, of Iraq, for example, you know, the M this was the early on, the multinational force, the multinational core, Iraq, you know, kind of who's, the, who's the joint force commander? What's the role of the ASOC? Uh, and I'm not going to go through all of these things, but these are continuing challenges that had to be worked through as we, as we progress through the campaign. One of, the, one of the facts of modern warfare is you're going to fight as a coalition, and it's a great thing. You know, the fact that it's not just the gringos going in and with a couple of folks. I mean, it's, a, it's truly a, a coalition effort. Uh, in this case, this was Allied force, but there were complications, and you can expect that these are going to, this is going to be the case in, a, in an operation. Target approval. I could give you an hour-long brief on the challenges of getting targets approved, through four different countries and, and, the, and some of the complications. And we had a, we had a spreadsheet, uh, essentially, that would have different target categories in every country and which types of targets some countries would and would not hit. So as an additional constraint as you began the targeting, for example, uh, AM radio stations. Some countries viewed that as freedom of the press, and we're not going to attack that. Some viewed it as a Milosevic propaganda vehicle, and so only certain aircraft from certain countries would agree to attack those. And by the way, then it got to do with, will, they, will you refuel aircraft that are going after that if they're based in your country? Will you support it in any other way by supplying electronic warfare or, or so forth? So it got to be very, very complicated. It's just a reality of, of coalition warfare. Uh, and, and by the way, the military folks involved, this has nothing to do with impugning the folks doing the mission, the, the airmen, the soldiers, sailors, marines from all countries doing this. This was, this was directed from higher up in the, in the political chains of each country. Not everybody has the same capa capabilities. Air refueling, ISR, electronic warfare, precision munitions, secure comms. Uh, that was a, a, a huge headache in that m typically you'll, you'll go to the least common denominator, and so much of the comms in Allied force was, uh, was unsecure in the open because not everybody had the encryption to be able to, to talk secure. Airspace control. This is a, what had happened was in the initial phases of Allied force, I got to tell you, I learned more about airspace control here uh, in, in a hurry than I ever wanted to because as the forces came in and we created more and more tracks, tanker tracks and, and uh, cast stacks and air-to-air -air areas and, and so forth, the airspace filled up. Uh, I'm curious, uh, any, of, any of you actually, did any of you fly in Allied Force? You probably know what I'm talking about, yeah. I mean, it was a, we were having a, at least one near miss every night um, in, because it, the airspace just became more <coughs> congested. So on the 1st of May of 1999, we instituted a complete change to the structure to allow uh, avenues and boulevards and, and restructure the airspace. But I got to tell you, trying to change, make a major airspace change in the middle of a war, boy, that was a, that was a challenge. We had had to send liaisons out to every base and brief them on what was going on. Uh, make sure everybody knew the, the, the changes and then just kind of held our breath as, uh, as we rolled it over, but it in, improved things. If you were involved in it, presumably in May, you notice huge changes and improvements in the safety and efficiency of airspace, but just had not, uh, had, had not anticipated that that was going to be the case. Munitions shortfalls ended up aircraft uh, countries running out of precision preferred munitions, ROE differences I talked about, all these kind of things as well. Host nations, you know, really worried. The country of Italy, you know, a great host, but they're worried about noise. They're worried about, uh, you know, if aircraft are dumping, their, they come back uh, and need to land and dump munitions. Where do you dump them? And some of those things are still out there in the, uh, in the Adriatic. All right, let me talk a little about uh, flexibility as we get into some of the challenges. And typically at the start of an operation, You'll, you'll be rolling along, and this is kind of where the focus is on air, uh, air interdiction and, and defensive counter-air, offensive counter-air, strategic attack. 
But pretty much every operation that, that I've been part of, over time, you'll shift, and more and more of your effort will be supporting other, other components. Uh, we started running out of targets in Allied Force. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, it wasn't too long after the start of Iraqi Freedom that there were no aircraft left to fly. Uh, in the uh, in the Iraqi Air Force, I mean, and so the weight of effort will will naturally shift as as you go through that, and so it looks like this, and the, the, the your theater air missions will shift to the support of the ground component, and this is it's something that happens, and I think it's food for thought. Is what happens is typically we don't have a sufficient liaison or or presence in the ground force, I would say, to anticipate this, and so. The ground component are developing missions that may not include the air support and the and the effectiveness of air, for example, to protect their flanks or to or to uh, do deception or something else. And so it is sometimes added in at the end of the plan. And it's something we got to think about: is okay as we move to this area, how do we provide more effective support to the ground component as the importance of the theater mission starts winding down? Uh, one of the challenges we have is, you know, we, get, we, we do operate on this centralized uh, basis, centralized control, decentralized execution. And it, and it works very, very well. And by the way, it's not centralized planning. It's, it's more than planning. It's synchronization. It's integration of, of, of the entire effort. But you need to have a backup plan. Um, and whose job is that, by the way? Is that the CFAC's job to have a backup plan? No, it's a COMAF-4 responsibility to ensure that because it typically the Air Force component, in, in this case, for example, supplied the, co the Combined Air Operations Center and also needs to supply the, the backup capability and, and test it. So, well, something to think about, because um, again, I, I think that the centralization model works pretty well when you've got that capability. Um, if you if you've not done so, I'd encourage you to read the the spider and the or spider and the starfish. And essentially, the the book talks about, although it kind of wanders off course towards the end of the book. But if you think about it, the chaos to me is kind of it's the spider model, and it does really really well. But if you smish the head of a spider, it's it's ineffective. As opposed to the starfish, you can chop off an arm and eventually it kind of grows the arm back and it can survive uh, you know, pretty serious uh, attacks. And, and I think what I would say as food for thought is this is our model here, but adversaries are coming to recognize that. And so we have got to evolve to a capability to be able to do uh, less, decent, less decentralized operations. And we've talked about you know, doing a distributed or adaptive control methodology but uh, otherwise, you, you find you're, you're gonna, I think you're going to be vulnerable to uh, either through kinetics or cyber having your centralized capability taken away. So we can talk more, more about that, but I think it, it's food for thought as a challenge. We've got to be prepared to operate in, a, in an area where, at least temporarily, uh, the CFAC at the headquarters is not able to communicate in real time. And, and so we need folks who can operate at the operational and tactical level without continual guidance from, from on high. And that get, gets into this, you know, staying at the right level as a CFAC. And this can be a problem. Uh, most folks who are working in the chaos came up in the tactical business. And frankly, most of them would rather be out there in the, in the tactical business flying the airplanes than necessarily being on the staff someplace. Um, and so, it's, it's a tendency, and unfortunately, I, I think we don't have the technology, but, but typically you'd have a, like, it's just like a window on the world here. See, we had, a, at the time, you know, if you had, I think we had five predator orbits at the time, and so they would be up on the wall, and you could kind of watch what was going on up there. And in this case, if we could roll it, um, you know, this building blows up. Um, and there's a tendency to get fixated on tactical level issues uh, to get a sense of what's going on out there. But, you, but you've got to resist the urge to, to focus on that. You've got to stay at the operational level. And as a CFAC also, you know, let the folks, let the folks out in the field do what they need to do. You stay at the operational level. But you still need to do battlefield circulation. You need to get out there and get a sense of, of what's going on. Uh, you're issuing these, uh, I found that you're issuing these, uh, 
the ATOs and the ACOs, uh, but you need to get out there and see the weather. You need to listen to the comms. You need to see what the challenges with rules of engagement are and experience that so you can uh, have, a, have a better capability to, uh, to command all that. Go visit the units uh, and, and, not, and, and those from other countries. Go where you're not comfortable. And uh, let me see if I can get this thing to work. There you go. You get out in the field once in a while, and that's, that's my trusty uh, backseater keggy after a mission. There we go. All right. Now I'm going to talk about some trends that, uh, and this is where, uh, you know, some of this is looking in a rearview mirror in the past, but here's some thoughts for the future. What are some of the trends? This is taken out of the Blue Horizons briefing, but it talks about technology trends for the next 15 to 20 years. So these are some things to think about as, uh, as future CFACs or working on an operational level staff. Uh, moving away from platform maneuverability and missiles, hypersonics and swarms, photonics, uh, dispersed operations versus big base. This is a huge discussion, particularly in the Pacific right now, as you have certain uh, bases where we've concentrated capability, which can become pretty lucrative targets for an initial volley of, uh, of theater ballistic missiles, for example. You know, how do we operate dis in dispersed manner? That can be a deterrent, but it also logistically is very challenging to operate off of a, a couple hundred dispersed fields and highway strips and, and those kind of things is, is a huge challenge and how do you make that happen? Moving from man to uh, remotely piloted or autonomous vehicles. Just one, I'll focus on one area and that's the unmanned area. So we kind of think about this as an offensive capability. We think about predators and reapers, but you, you know what? Other countries are thinking about this as well and this is something that CFACs are going to have to think about from a counter air standpoint. Uh, small, cheap, easy to obtain. Tend not to recognize the threat that these will, will pose to us in terms of uh, adversary use of unmanned systems. And, and the likelihood is we're going to face adversaries that will have access to uh, small unmanned unmanned systems and need to be included into your counter air plan and your airspace plan. So they got to be included in airspace control, area defense, the spins, the ROE, interoperable systems, and then the c command and control of counter air ops below the coordinating altitude. That's typically where you're going to find some of, the, some of these. And, and airspace control is a huge challenge because everybody, uh, everybody wants their own airspace but you need a centralized capability of commanding and controlling it. So, I think I managed to get through that in most uh, in about 40 minutes. Those were the, what I talked about. So, what questions might you have that this is, uh, has this sparked any thoughts? Apparently, uh oh. Ah,